the nonprofit podcast powered by DonorBox. It's almost time for nonprofit fundraising event season to tee off. As the season approaches, nonprofits need to ensure they're hitting the green with their planning. We know that organizing a successful fundraising event can feel like an uphill battle, but fear not from finding the perfect location to securing sponsors and volunteers. We're here to help ensure your fundraising event is a hole in one. Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Jenna, the Nonprofit Advocate here at DonorBox. We are here each week with practical actions you can use today to take your nonprofit to the next level tomorrow. And today I'm excited to be joined by a true pro in the nonprofit fundraising game and someone I deeply admire, Jeffrey Brown, Chief Marketing and Development Officer at Steam Truck, an organization doing great work for youth in the greater Atlanta area. Jeffrey has driven success for all the organizations he has served with some fantastic fundraising events, including, you guessed it, golf fundraisers. So grab your clubs and get ready to learn from the best as we drive your fundraising event game to new heights. Thank you. I don't think I've ever had an open quite that well. For those who are listening, we will not fill this 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 podcast with golf puns. Um, no. so these are the only ones that you're going to get. At least on yes. the front end. Okay. Now, before we dive into the topic of golf fundraising events, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in the nonprofit sector, Jeffrey? Yeah, no, no problem. So I've been um, in the fundraising space since after after college. So I graduated from UGA um, and immediately joined the fundraising space in 2007. So my first job right out of college was uh, with the Boy Scouts of America, North, Northeast Georgia Council Boy Scouts. Spent eight and a half years there doing fundraising, recruiting kids, volunteers, program management, other duties as assigned as we all in the nonprofit space live and die by. Um, but I yep. spent eight and a half years there and then transitioned over to Partnership Against Domestic Violence as their vice president of development and marketing. Spent seven years there. And then in April, I will have spent a year as the chief marketing and development officer for Steam Truck. Thank you for sharing. And I'm so glad that I got to serve with you at PADV, which makes this interview extra special. And going down that road, uh, we've talked a bit about fundraisers and I've seen all of your success with what you've done and been so inspired by the work that you've done for these orgs. Uh, and something that you are here to talk with us today is about the golf fundraising event that you organized and hosted for the Partnership Against Domestic Violence. Yes, ma'am. So what inspired you to choose golf of all things as a fundraising strategy for this organization? Full transparency, back then when we did our golf tournament for PADV, that was out of necessity because that was in COVID or it, it was in the midst of COVID. I think we had come out of lockdown and, you know, organizations weren't doing indoor events yet. And so we were pivoting to what can we do outdoors? So for historical context, the PADV, Partnership Against Domestic Violence, had always hosted um, a breakfast where we invited a survivor out to come and speak. And, you know, it was a lot of women and men from the community would come out to this this, this early morning breakfast at a country club um, where we would, you know, obviously educate them on different aspects of domestic violence. And so that was always a breakfast held indoors. And but because of COVID, we weren't allowed to, to do that event. And then I think we had just passed our gala, which we weren't allowed to do, obviously. And so we were coming up on this space of we got to do something right. Like, you know, our donors were amazing. They, had, you know, they were still supporting us. And however, we had asked them to a lot, like many organizations, right? They rolled over donations. They did everything that they possibly could. Um, but from an organizational standpoint, we just felt like we needed to get out in front of our donors. The breakfast was so important because not only did it raise money for the organization, but it also drove awareness. And so we were like, the awareness piece around domestic violence is so important that we like, we need to do an event because one, we want to do a fundraiser. We want to continuously stay in that donor cycle, but we also need to raise awareness. We also have to be out in front of our, our donors talking about domestic violence. So we uh, we picked a golf tournament because I had done one before at the Boy Scouts. And we felt like, you know, given the community that we served, we felt like that was a good space to engage our donors, donors again. Something that we often say here, and especially amid event season, is you should not be throwing a fundraiser if your only goal is to raise money. Yeah. So that engagement and that awareness that you're talking about 
is really key. So thinking about this massive pivot Mm -hmm. that you've done from formal breakfasts with auctions and probably panelists and all of that, and then shifting into this golf fundraiser. How do you inform your supporters of this change? And what was the response? A, A great question. And so one of my things that I really stand upon as a fundraiser is how do we move our organizations out of this transactional state of fundraising to this more relationship-based fundraising. And we all say that, right? Nonprofits across the board, everybody in my position says that. But how do we take it to heart? How do we how do we do this thing very meaningfully? And honestly, it started with just conversation. I called up our largest donors and I said, hey, this is what we want to do. And so so that people know full transparency, we positioned our event so that our largest donor sponsored both events. And so that was one of the ways and mechanisms that we got them to consider a significant increase one year to the next was making them the presenting sponsor of our gala and at the time our breakfast. And so I went to I went to um, our largest sponsor and I said, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Um, if we do that, obviously the visibility that you traditionally have at our breakfast is going to look a little bit different than it will at our golf tournament. Is that something that you are okay with continuing to sponsor. And then after this season's over, and we if we pivot back to the breakfast, are you willing to then pivot with us to go back to sponsoring the breakfast? And I literally had that conversation with our largest donor, all of our largest donors for the Women in Action Breakfast. I had that same conversation with all of them. And I said, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. And most of them were like, you know what? We we didn't anticipate this conversation. Um, we thank you for 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 thinking of us. And all of them, I want to say, did the pivot with us. Um, and then the committee that went along with planning the breakfast. So before any contracts were signed, before any pivots were official, we went and had conversations with all of our stakeholders, even some of the volunteers that were were extremely important in making the breakfast happen. And so not taking anything for granted, we just had real conversations with people and told them where our heart was. If you don't ask, the answer is always no, always. as I always say. And it sounds like it was a positive response because... You were so transparent and so direct Mm -hmm. with your intention behind it. And I think what we also did, and our our Women in Action Breakfast targets a certain subset of the population, right? Traditionally, we had more women come to the Women in Action Breakfast. And then when we made that pivot to doing a golf tournament, we understood that we're probably going to, in most cases, going to be talking to a totally different demographic. And so we had to have really honest conversation with ourselves to say, is that okay, right? And if it's not, how do we then position this event so that we don't lose the the women and the people who have traditionally supported our event because they didn't play golf? We were able to, to do some other things with the golf tournament that still spoke to our traditional demographic, and it's it still encompassed elements of the Women in Action Breakfast so that everybody felt like, yes, I can recruit a new demographic of people to come and play in our golf tournament. But if I'm still used to having this traditional style of Women in Action Breakfast, I can still be a part of that as well. So, And I'm hearing from you is no matter how different the event was, it was true to your purpose, true mm-hmm. to your mission, true to your brand. Mm-hmm. And that's what made that transition more digestible mm-hmm. to your support. Can you walk me through a bit of your process from that starting point mm-hmm. to reaching out to your supporters, finding the right demographic and the segments for your audience? So so the, the first thing we started with was, um, you brought up a really great point, is was we, we started with the brand. And so we said, who are we? In all of our events that we do, we have to make sure that mission comes first. And so first we said, how do we bring our mission to life while still hosting a golf tournament? And so once we were able to say that, yes, we could we could bring our mission to life while hosting a golf tournament, that informed every other decision. And so, like I said, we started off by creating messaging that highlighted mission first And then we started specifically talking to golfers and talking to sponsors. And honestly, that part was fairly easy because we did the front work of going to our sponsors 
and saying, this is the pivot that we want to make. Will you still support us? And most of them said yes. And so when we made it official and we released sponsorship docs and we released all of the, the funding that we would need, everybody signed up. Now, we also made sure that the sponsorship tiers matched. Um, so if you were used to funding the breakfast at a $5,000 level, insert random sponsorship level, then we created a package that was meaningful for you on the golf side. So if if, if $5,000 got you five seats at the breakfast, we said $5,000 got you a foursome at the golf tournament so that you as a sponsor, we're still seeing some equitable value as it jumped from one end to the other. So that's what we that's what we thought through, right? Is how do we how do we make sure that our sponsors still felt value as we created this golf tournament? And what we were also able to do was leverage that conversation, but with existing sponsors and existing people who had been used to sponsoring the breakfast, we also said, hey, if golf is not your thing, we also have this beginner's clinic. That's half the time as a golf tournament, right? You can come out, have a great time. It's a smaller group, takes less than a golf, it's less than your traditional golf tournament. You come out, you can sponsor that as well, and you can learn the game of golf. And then we're going to have a separate program for those who want to just learn a little bit more about domestic violence and, and how do we how do we serve serve survivors? So we we had our traditional golf tournament. And then we also had what we called the beginner's clinic, which really spoke more towards the original client base of, of our breakfast. And so that's really how we were able to to raise more money than we had raised before, because we got sponsors that were previously booked to say yes. We got new sponsors that really like the idea of being able to attend a golf tournament and host clients and all the rest of the stuff that they do with golf tournaments. And then to make sure that our traditional person who likes to go to our breakfast, we started that beginner's clinic that allowed them to have their own event. And then at the end of that event, we still had a survivor come and speak. We still did all the, a lot of the traditional elements from that breakfast. Something that I'm seeing too, is that nonprofits who are hosting these types of events, they're really focusing on those add-ons and those experiences Mm -hmm. that creates an inclusive mm-hmm. experience for everybody that appeals to all types. And it really enhances that fun element, but also it's kind of built in revenue enhancers mm-hmm. yep. too, because and, and you it, are catering from, to everyone. From, from, a, from a, you know, speaking about the beginner's clinic specifically, it doesn't cost us more money because we already, we've already rented the golf course. Right. And so when the shotgun starts, you know, the players leave the the putting greens, they leave the the driving range, they leave the chipping area. And so we've already rented that space. And so it's the only extra from a cost add on is more food, which is a, you know, is a wash because people are paying a registration fee. And then we paid a, a pro or two pros to come out and teach, have essentially have a couple hours of golf lessons. So it doesn't matter if we had 50 people or, or 150 people the golf pro expense is still whatever it was. It, it wasn't tied to a, an amount of people who were there. So the expenses on that side were minimal, whereas the income growth from that was huge. Let's loop back to venue. You mentioned venue that was already taken care of. So it's easy to budget in that way. I think a common misconception is that all or most of your fundraising revenue goes to paying the golf facility. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of finding the venue, first of all, and what you think about the value, I guess, of the golf area? So for us, we, we, we really looked at what's the total cost our, of our sponsorship going to be? So what's that top line sponsorship going to be? And then let's decide on those tiers of sponsorship. And then that'll drive the golf course that we want to find, right? And so if we're going to go to a super, super high-end golf course, then that means our sponsorship dollar has to be super high-end as well. And, and can we, as an organization, support or do we have the sponsorships and a lot of site on sponsors that are willing to pay that top tier golf uh, experience, right? At the Boy Scouts, we had that, right? We had a sponsorship 
where the where the top tier sponsorship was seventy five thousand dollars. When we came to PADV, this was our first golf tournament. And so saying that we wanted to set a title sponsorship or a presenting sponsorship at that value, we couldn't support that from a sponsorship base. So that meant we had to go and find a golf course who could give us, you know, hey, we want bang for our buck. We want to look for a space that's really, really beautiful. But but still, we wanted to have some real conversation around how do we create value for our golfers? And so we, instead of picking the super, super high-end golf course, we, we were just really honest and realistic about where we were as an organization. And that's not where we were at the time. So let's take a step back. Let's find a golf course that would meet all our needs, that had a beautiful facility, that had the quality of the food that we would want, that al- would allow us to bring our stuff in and allow us to place our branding the places that we wanted to place it. Because again, when you're talking about certain kind of country clubs or certain kind of golf courses, everybody's rules about where you can place branding and where you can bring your experience to life is going to be a little bit different. And so really finding a golf course that'll allow you to showcase the best version of yourself as an organization speaks volumes. And so there's a sweet spot. And we visited as a committee, I want to say five or seven different golf courses, and then settled in on the one that was willing to work with us from a financial perspective. Because again, we're in COVID. Who's willing to to meet us in the middle? Who's willing to, to allow us to do some things from a branding perspective that we would want to do? And then honestly, who who has a really good price and has good food? That's a great message to our listeners to do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. It's a very time consuming process and it can be very appealing to go with vendors and venues and services, their first quote, but challenging them to give them their best. Often there are nonprofit deals in comparing different places will really help you stay within budget because something like this, you could blow it on extras, whereas money could be well served somewhere else. So I think that's a great message to Mm -hmm. folks. All right. From point A to point Z, what advice would you give other nonprofit organizations looking to host a golf fundraising event for the first time? Your story is important. Your brand is important. And a lot of times we spend more time focusing on the golf tournament and and what gets lost in that is who we are. Why are we here? Like the why has to matter and the why has to be what drives you. How do I tell the story of my organization while the golfers are out on the course? It's not just playing golf. As much as we, yes, we want to to make sure that golfers have a great experience. We also have to figure out how we are going to tell our story as an organization while the golfers are experiencing that. And so for me, I think the gift and the curse of my roles has always been marketing and fundraising have always existed in my position. And so it's not silo whereas marketing is over here and development is over here. It's always existed with me. So I'm in charge of telling this organization's story. And so that stays front and center for me at all times. Um, it's specifically with an org like Partnership Against Domestic Violence or all of our orgs. Our, our stories are important. Our mission's important. And we don't want to get lost in this is just a golf tournament. Oh, what are we going to give the golfers when they come off the course. Oh, how are we going to recognize golfers? What's the trophy we want to give? But we also don't want to be exploitative of our clients, right? We don't want to traipse our client, have our clients sitting on every hole so that they can tell their survivor story. That's not the that's that's not tasteful at all. But we also want to make sure that our missions are front and center because that's where that's where true relationship that's where true magic happens right as fundraisers you know we like to believe that our donors are our superheroes and they're not our donors are great people but at the end of the day the people that we serve are the superheroes they're the ones that are out there doing the heavy lifting to change their life no matter what organizations we serve and i think as long as we keep their stories at the center of all of our work and we make them the superhero then i think our donors will respond to that way of thinking Words to live by. So giving opportunities at the event. Of course, people have purchased their tickets. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they were able to give a donation while purchasing a ticket as Mm -hmm. well. Now, while they're on the course, where are their opportunities to give and how are they able to do that? You know, traditionally at golf tournaments, you see the whole sponsorship sign that's there. But we also, at every tee box, we also set another sign that spoke directly to mission, right? 
these are some hyper local stats around around domestic violence. Here's some impact things that we did this year. Here's uh, a quote from a kid or a quote from a woman around the impact of this organization. And then, boom, something simple. Drop a QR code right there. You know, hey, and it doesn't necessarily have to be at every hole, right? It's thank you so much for your support because of your effort. This is what we're able to do. Consider giving again or giving here. And in full transparency, you have to think through staggering those. So at hole one or hole first three holes, I may not even ask for money. It's just impact, impact, impact. And then on the fourth hole, it's thank you so much for being here. Help us continue to the work by making a donation. So it's not necessarily that we're asking for money on every hole. We set up packages on the front end that allowed people to buy mulligans or whatever. So we're not nickel and diming them on the holes. But every couple of holes, boom, 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 we're asking, hey, consider, consider making a donation to the organization. And we can't be afraid of that. Because if we think about who is paying for them to be here, it's the corporation. If I am there playing, I probably haven't paid anything unless I've unless I'm paying for the foursome for my friends. But if I'm there on a corporate ticket, the corporation paid for it. And so we'd be doing ourselves as fundraisers a disservice if we didn't ask the individual who's coming to also contribute to our mission. So you can do that at the front when people are checking in. A lot of this is training our volunteers to make that ask after you buy your mulligans or whatever. You can make a you can make a separate donation to the organization in any amount you like. So, how much did you raise for the total event? Uh, total event, I think we raised over forty thousand dollars in year one. Amazing. Expenses were maybe seven, six or seven thousand dollars, something like that, which for us was super exciting because again, this is year one, and mm-hmm. that matched the total of the breakfast. And so that was the goal. Can we match the total of the breakfast in year one or match what we had budgeted for the breakfast in year one? And we did. Incredible. Wrapping up, are there any new trends or things in the fundraising event space that you're particularly excited about or interested in exploring for the future? Yeah. So one of the things I I see coming from our perspective is more intimate engagements. Um, And so, yes, are we still doing these large scale events? Yes, right? Like those I don't think are ever going to go away. But I don't think you have to shy away from doing these smaller intimate, if we're smaller, or even if we're a large organization, doesn't matter our size, you know, having these small intimate gatherings where our staff or our leaders are able to really come out and share with people the impact of this organization on a small scale. Yes, we're going to continue to do these large scale events, but we also don't let's not shy away from doing these really, really intimate events that are low cost, but have huge that pay huge dividends. And if we find the right board member or find the right person, most of the time they're willing to underwrite the cost of that small event. In some cases, host that small event for us. And that just makes it so much more meaningful and from a staff and fundraiser, fundraiser meaning me as the fundraiser, not the event fundraiser, but as the fundraiser, it's more low impact on me to show up to a small event. And in some cases, it's a small event that we may not even ask for money. It's just come out, get to know the organization, get to know our work. And, and that's paying huge dividends for us. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for being here with us today. Oh, this is fun. I'll do it again whenever you want me to. That sounds great. And everyone, we have a free downloadable resource for you. Check out the show notes for the link to our charity golf fundraiser checklist to access a detailed outline of the task you and your team will need to accomplish before, during, and after putting on a golf event. And thank you for choosing to spend time with the nonprofit podcast. I hope you've left with the confidence to take a small step today that will make a big difference tomorrow. Don't forget to download and review the podcast or give it a thumbs up if you're listening to the nonprofit podcast on YouTube. Your review is a great way to help others find us. You're here to help others. We're here to help you. Until next time, stay inspired. That warm feeling when you help someone, it's not just happiness, it's fulfillment. And we believe it should be available to everyone. From frontline heroes to first time fundraisers, our tools empower you to help others. This is our mission. This is DonorBox, helping you help others.